Business Connections Live, the UK's leading online business channel. Business Connections Live with Steve Highland. Hello there, welcome along. This is Business Connections Live, the program for entrepreneurs, SMEs and business owners. Now, a really interesting subject that we're talking about today is all about customer experience. The What actually happens to your customers when they, when they come to your business, when they are interacting with your organisation? What kind of faux pas Pofars, what kind of faux pas are you making when you are interacting with them? And is it all about you or is it all about them? How's it all working out? On today's show, uh, we're going to be discussing the four key principles for delighting your customers and transforming the fortunes of your organization. My guest on today's show is Jerry Brown, the customer lifeguard. Jerry, an absolute pleasure to have you in the program today. Thank you, Steve. It's, um, this is a big, big, big area, isn't it, when it, it really comes is. to customer experience. I don't think there's anybody that you can walk up to who will not have a story about both bad service and great service. You don't hear the ones in the middle, do you? People never go on about average or day-to-day -day service, but everybody will have a bad story and everybody will have a good story. Absolutely. How bad do you think it is out there when it comes to the customer experience? Are we good at it or are we bad at it? it it's sort of like the issue. It's a bit of a Marmite thing to a certain extent. I think what it is is that it's got better uh, I've been uh, uh, back in the UK now for the last uh, uh, 18, almost 19 years, having come over from, from Canada in 1998. And when we first came back from Canada at that point, customer service here was, was appalling. And I think it has improved. There's no question about that. And I think a number of things have, have brought that into focus. I think people, as they travel more, and especially if they go to the US and Canada, clearly I'm going to be supportive of, of that that environment, but I think when they go and see what great service really is like, and I realize to a certain extent, you go to the US, you get a lot of have a nice day and all of that kind of stuff, and you get the same thing in Canada. And the point I make to a lot of people is that in Canada, they actually mean it. So I think what's, what's interesting <laughs> is, is that- Is that because you're Canadian? It probably has something to do with it. <laughs> uh, but the, the point being is I think people realize what great service is, and you're right. You, you get these, these experiences where they're either really bad or really good. I think what's happening is that, is that that people are realizing that, firstly, they don't have to accept it. And this is just one of the things that, that I do a lot of work on is making sure that if service is really bad, that people do something about it. And I think one of the things that does happen here in the UK is that people are less likely to complain. They're less likely to go after an organization that's given them bad service because they believe it's too hard or they can't be bothered. It's not worth the effort. So as a result, we probably don't hear a lot about it. There's a very interesting uh, study done recently by the Ombudsman Service. They figured out that in 2015 there were approximately 56 million complaints to helplines, online, the Ombudsman Service from, from people. And you think, well that's quite a lot. But then they also found out there was somewhere in the region of 70 million problems that didn't get mentioned. Nobody bothered complaining for the very simple reason it was too hard. They just couldn't be bothered. So a lot of it goes unheard. So Companies generally will say, complaints are good for us. We want to hear those complaints. And I'm not terribly sure they do. Um, I think they're happy if we're moaning to each other, but they're not as quite as happy or quite as ready to deal with it when we want to make a complaint. And the reality is, of course, when the Ombudsman did this study, a lot of it was to the organizations that are in regulated industries. So if you're in the financial services industry and you have to deal with a complaint, or if you're a telco dealing with Ofcom, or a utility company where there's been a lot of focus lately dealing with Ofgem, it costs you a lot of money to deal with a formal complaint. So if someone gets to the point where they're really upset and decide to make a formal complaint, that becomes very expensive. So companies should be dealing with it. Companies should be looking at ways that they can offset this. And the ways to do that really are to start 
making it, if you like, making it easier to make a complaint and making it easier to resolve that. As I think if you pointed out, we've all had those experiences. When I tell people what they do, they immediately launch into a story about some bad service they've had from a telco, from a bank. And you can almost guarantee it'll be very similar. You know, the company hasn't shown up. They were supposed to do an installation. They didn't come. They didn't let me, let, let me know and so on. So generally you find it in the same thing. But on the other hand of it, yes, things are getting better. There are some companies doing some fabulous service. And if you look at the organizations that typically are at the top of the tree, people like John Lewis, people like First Direct, people like Metro Bank, these are people that recognize the value in delivering a really top class customer service and the customer experience that comes with it. So there are companies out there then that are actually doing it and they getting are. it right. Absolutely. Um, the last time I saw you doing a talk, a presentation, you were actually talking from the, the customer's perspective. Indeed. That we should all go out and complain. I don't know about you whether you've ever uh, complained recently or maybe you know to a utility company or an organization uh, that you are dealing with. H have you taken the time to sit down and how do you go about doing it? Do you do you go through the customer complaints procedure that they've set up for you, or do you shortcut that and go straight to the top? I tell you what, we'll, we'll briefly talk about that now, because really sure. what I want to talk about is how businesses can improve their, their customer interaction, how of they course. can actually make it better for their customers. Sure. But what would be the advice that you would give to people who are experiencing at the moment bad service from a supplier? Well, as, as you mentioned, um, when, when I spoke about that, I was talking it from, from a customer perspective because that's really where I form my ideas. And so it's been my experience that I'm having worked with a lot of people in contact centers and stores and, and various places, these people really do care. I, I, I don't for a moment think that they get up in the morning and think, boy, I wonder how many people we can upset today. Uh, you may think some people do, but they, <laughs> they, they're good, decent people. You know, they're kind to the kids, they don't kick their dog, they're really good, and they want to help, they really do. But they're hamstrung by bad policies, by dumb rules, and quite often they say, I'm sorry, we're not allowed to, or we can't help you, or whatever. So I'm always prepared to give them an opportunity to fix it, one shot. So whatever the issue is, I'll certainly either, if I, I, I may email, I may uh, call in, whatever it happens to be. But if that does not achieve the result that I'm expecting, then I will, I will simply go right to the top. And I found a great deal of success. I like writing letters because I think people don't write as many letters, but that can take a little longer. There's a certain immediacy with email. So I found it very successful. Sending an email is very easy now to find out the email addresses of most senior people. It's not hard. And typically, my, my rule of thumb will be I'll, I'll send a note to usually three of them. If it's a, a global corporation and they're headquartered in Canada, the US, I'll certainly include them. And it's a simple, really, uh, try to be polite. You know, the odd time I've, I've lost it, but most of the time I'm polite. You know, I'm really disappointed with the performance. I would have expected more from a company like you. Uh, I've shared this story with my friends and family who are equally disappointed, et cetera, et cetera. And it really doesn't take that long. And generally speaking, uh, you and I were talking about this earlier, generally speaking, you'll get a reaction within hours because frankly, once that goes to a senior executive, he or she may not read it. It doesn't matter whether they do or not. Somebody will. Somebody will take action because that's the last thing they need. So my experience has and, been that. the reason worked. for that is because it is more expensive for them. At that point, does it become more expensive, do you well, think? Well, I think what it does, it highlights it. And, and yes, they know it will become more expensive because they figure if you're willing to take the time to find out who the CEO or the MD is, to write it, even if it's a letter, just an email, they know you're serious. They know that you won't stop there. And I think they recognize they better, they better nip it in the bud, take care of it at that point, because if they don't, it is really going to take some time and money out of their, out of their time. So what they want to do is really find a way that they can they can satisfy your complaint. Now, this is, this is very much a direct way, a very mm, direct approach to, to talking to the CEOs and the, the senior management within an organization. That's right. There is a trend, though, isn't there, to be using social media. So you, you're, you're shaming people. Do you think that has the same effect? I don't think it does. I, I think I think we've we, we've we've seen some classic cases. Um, the, you know, the best case I think is uh, uh, which goes back quite a few years, which is United Breaks Guitars, which is a, uh, a good friend of mine in Canada, Dave Carroll, who had a terrible experience with United Airlines, did a YouTube uh, video, and it's it's 
it, it's probably had 12, 15 million views since then. So it's kind of the poster child for here's how we do it. Uh, I think also Lily Allen was a, a good example of that. She had a terrible experience with BT, and she went and tweeted, and of course she would have millions of followers. And uh, she, she just went on and said, does anyone know, if anyone uh, knows who the head of BT is, because I don't have any broadband, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. It can be effective, but I think it's gone to the stage now where because of the way that these are handled, and, and again, I'm, I'm fairly uh, uh, aware of how the whole social media is handled within an organization. They generally have some people that do that. And quite often you, you put something there and they're, they're a little bit condescending. They, they, again, they're just trying to send you somewhere else. So you'll get a note back from them and say, oh, I'm really sorry to hear this, Jerry. You know, let's see what we can do. And they'll send you a link. I've had this experience with a couple of mobile phone companies. And they'll send you a link saying, well, this is how you can improve your mobile coverage or something like that. They actually don't deal with it. So unless it becomes a really big issue, as the one that I've mentioned. Generally speaking, you may feel better. There's no question. You'll think, oh, this is this. I've got up on my Facebook yeah, I've page. Done I've told the world. I've Absolutely. told all my friends. Well, I'm not sure it's as effective. Uh, and I think organizations are realizing it, it and they are recognizing it. I'm not, I'm not downplaying it. I'm simply saying that I think if you want, if you really want action, direct action is the way to do it. Do you think organizations in uh, the UK, across Europe, even, even in America, do you think we are getting customer service right well, I think I think the the focus that's being put on it is getting to that stage. I think that, do we just pay it lip service? Do you think? Well, I think we have. I don't. I think some businesses still do, but I, but I do think there are organisations, and I and I have written about some of those in the various blogs and articles that I've written that that really do know how to do it. And I think this is kind of where I I started to think about what was what were the underlying things. So there's this whole concept that I started to write about the four principles of customer experience really lent on the things that they needed to do. You know, what are the things that they really need to look at? So I think organizations are realizing it. And if you sit where I sit and I'm I'm sort of seeing all of the conferences and all of the webinars and all of the things on customer experience, you'd swear, wow, there's, there's, there's so much going on. It must be getting better. And I think you see, uh, even today, you, 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 I get emails with the headline, 80% of CEOs say that customer experience is their top priority for 2017. Well, I've been seeing that for 10 years, and I've been hearing it. As a customer, I haven't really experienced it. But I do think that more people are beginning to take it seriously. I believe that the, the, the issue, I think, has been also finding out whether it pays off, because I, that's what's going to happen. I wonder sometimes when, we're, when we hear these kind of things about customer experience, for, there are some organizations that will have their mantras. Mm. And I think the board level may well believe that that's what they're trying to achieve. But the, the workers, uh, the people that have to deliver on this promise, I think they're just taking the mic. Or, I mean, there's some organizations, you know, yeah. wear the customer's shoes. Yes. You, you hear all the, you know, and if you can find their slippers, wear those as well. <laughs> Shoot the penguin, by the way. Yeah. But I mean, the, you know, there's, there's those things which are just very hollow promises. Yes. And I think that's a very good point, Steve. I think that the, you know, the marketing company com comes up with these, these great slogans. And what I found, what's very interesting, is if you ask an employee in one of these businesses, so if I'm working with their frontline people in the contact center in the store, what do you think this, this means? What, what does this slogan mean to you? You will find many of them really struggle to either identify with it, articulate what it means to them. And so I think it, quite often they do this. But there are, again, businesses that do live what the, the, the promise. And I think that those are the ones that have, have associated their mission statement with their purpose. That, that's the critical part. Hold that thought because sure. we're going to come back and we're going to look at those four principles as okay. well on this program. I tell you what, that first 12 minute segment <laughs> there alone has been worth watching actually. If you are a business and you feel, yes, we've got all the words written down, we're doing everything that we think we should be doing, uh, but in fact, you're just not delivering on that promise that you've made, the promise you've made to yourselves even, then this is going to be the pro for you. Hope you're enjoying today. My guest is Jerry Brown, the customer lifeguard on this edition of Business Connections Live. You know, it's always great to be live with you on a Monday. And the nice thing about it is that what you see here is never unedited. So I don't know what he's going to say over the next uh, hour or so. I'm not so. sure what I'm going to and say. And he's not, he's not saying either, which is even more worrying. But the thing about this is that if we can just give you one little grain of information that you can go away and that you can put into your business and make it work within your organization, then then all of this is worthwhile. Uh, don't forget, if you'd like to get in contact with us, I'll give you all the details in a moment, but, but do drop us an email if you've got any comments about what you're seeing. Well, look, leave them uh, below the, the video. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, give us a comment there. If you're watching on iTunes, you know, respond back, send us an email. Uh, email. Great response on iTunes at the moment. Thousands 
thousands <laughs> of downloads uh, each and every month. Thank you very much. Recommend it to a friend. Don't be keeping the secret to yourself. You're getting all this great business information for free and you're not telling anybody. Share it around. Tell everybody uh, everything there is to know. Now, last week we had a slightly different program. We were looking at, um, well, we were looking at uh, how to be, how to focus yourself to allow yourself more time, 10 minutes of your time a day to allow you to focus on everything that is around you. Our uh, guest on last week's show was Tom Evans. He's the author of the Authority Guide to Practical Mindfulness. It's a bit of a buzzword, mindfulness, at the moment. He came into the studio. It was a great show, really, really interesting. And uh, he asked the question, how to improve your productivity, creativity, and focus by slowing down just for 10 minutes a day. Now, when the program finished last week, he actually sat down and he did a little meditation session, which we recorded and is available to download now. If you go to his program page, you can download it. But just to give you a bit of a taster on what we were talking about last week's edition of the program, here's Tom Evans of last week's Business Connections Live. My guest of today's show is Tom Evans. He's the author of The Authority Guide to Practical Mindfulness. Well, the, the name that seems to be in vogue at the moment is mindfulness, mindfulness meditation. And it, this is a kind of Buddhist thing. But I've got to say from the outset that I'm not a Buddhist or an anythingist at all. I was a stressed out person in my mid 40s and someone said, you look really haggard. One of the classic ways that people discover meditation is when they're really stressed and really pressured. And I'd actually moved away from the broadcast industry at that time. I should emphasize there's a difference between mindfulness and meditation. And there's also a term called mindfulness meditation, but there's loads of scientific research nowadays that proves that it really, really works. Medium term benefits, you become more creative and you start to find out you've got more time on your hands. But also the latest uh, scientific research is showing that it's actually increasing people's longevity. Because in business, um, if you're an entrepreneur, you've got to be ahead of the pack. And any business is reliant on its source of ideas and innovation. Um, the best entrepreneurs actually follow their gut. And our gut mind now, it's been proven, has got more neurons than a cat's brain, and it's an active mind center. And the weirdest thing about the gut mind, uh, and some, some scientists in Sweden have seen this, is that it seems to operate five seconds ahead of our conscious mind. Well, there's, there's three other techniques, and they're all kind of interchangeable. And, and what, if you listen to some of my meditations, and meditations from other people, they mix and match them. The other, me the other meditation technique is a mantra. So you meditate on a, on a sound. Classically, it'd be something like an om, but I bring everything into the English language. So I've got a mantra called be calm. And you say be on the in-breath internally, and you say calm on the out-breath. Be calm. And if you just do that, and you combine that with the breathing, if you like, as well, it calms you down. And you as well notice other people, you go to a business networking meeting, don't have the script inside your head of all the things that you want to get at, listen to what other people are saying. When you're being interviewed, really listen to the question and be mindful of, of the audience, the, mind, the audience being a business audience. In my brain myth about logical on one side, the left side, and creative on the other side is just a myth. It came around in the 70s. There was a guy called Roger Sperry. It's just a myth. It's just a myth, yeah. It's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a good approximation, but it's not quite how it works. But when you get into the whole brain state, which, is, which you get induced by the yoga, yoga does this as well, or this alternate nostril breathing, you end up in this state where you jump outside space and time, and I call it the EMT state, extended me time. And the job that you've got on hand seems to get done in the time that you've allocated to it. So you go into the business networking environment and uh, a lot of people would, would sort of get their business cards out and aim for people. My attitude would be to go there, just stand back and allow people to arrive. Well, it's interesting. Firstly, we must uh, bear in mind that time, as we know it, seconds, minutes, hours, uh, weeks and months don't exist. Men made them up. And they're really useful because it made sure that I turned up on time for this interview today, which is really useful. And other people watching it live turn up at the right time. So our time system is really good because it allows us to make sure all the planes don't land, land at Heathrow at the same time. So we like time, right? But what's happened as a result of it, and especially now we've gone 24 seven, 365 days a year, we become enslaved by it. So because time is a good thing and it's got some negative connotations, we just dump the negative connotations. So for example, when I'm writing a book, I will make appointments with all the chapters in the book. 
Well, I have to say that I gave this no thought at all, uh, which is brilliant. So I didn't, didn't waste any time thinking about what I was going to say. And I want to give you a takeaway, which is designed for business people to always make the right decision. So if you've got a decision to be faced, what you do is you ask your gut, is, does it think it's a good idea? Does it give it a green light or a red light? If it gives it a green light, then go ahead and move on to your heart, which I'll explain in a minute. If it gives it a red light, ask what has to change so you would like that idea and you could, you could give it a green light. Then you move up to your heart and you ask your heart about this idea. Is it cold? Is it lukewarm? Is it hot or is it boiling hot? And if it's cold or lukewarm, ask again what has to change so you could fall in love with it. And when you get a green light from your gut and your heart is either warm or, or boiling about the idea, you move to your head. Then in your head, you ask your left brain, has it got enough detail? If it hasn't, what detail do you need to know? And in your right brain, you ask, have you got the whole vision for the idea? Once you're armed with all of this stuff, you know about this idea, you've got all the detail you need, move ahead with gusto, knowing you've made a fantastic decision. Tom Evans, a fantastic show. If you get an opportunity to watch the entire program, you'll find it more relaxing. Uh, the thing that he taught me, the, the one thing that I took away from it was all about breathing. We, I mentioned on the program, I have one of these smart watches. I have a, an iWatch. And one of the things that it's actually got, other watches, of course, are available, but this particular iWatch, uh, what it does do is it will, every so often during the day, it, it will buzz on my arm and go breathe. And of course, you kind of think that's just it, just taking the mickey out of you, really. You know, don't forget, breathe in, breathe out. But actually, it takes you through a process is where you will stop for a moment and you do a mini meditation. You breathe in and you breathe out. And on last week's program, of course, Jerry, um, Tom was talking about, not Jerry, Tom was talking about um, stay calm or be calm. Be on the in and then calm. And I think sometimes business owners get completely lost and they're just so busy that they forget about their own well-being. And that program was all about your well-being. If you get a chance, do watch it. Uh, by the way, if you want to watch all the programs, you can also go to our website. But if you want to contact us, maybe you've watched one of the programs and you're thinking to yourself, I'd like to add a bit of that. I'd like to comment comment on it or I'd like to get in touch and have a program just like that one all you've got to do is drop us an email it's dead easy to do just drop us an email to studio at businessconnectionslive.com easy peasy uh, if you want you can give us a call we like that we don't mind talking to people 01784 256 777 is our telephone number you can follow our stream of consciousness on Twitter at BCL Business TV people over the weekend saying that uh, Twitter should be making a fortune and it's beginning to drop off of course, there is one big uh, person that is using it at the moment, and he's doing national policy. <laughs> national policy uh, by using it. Thank you very much. Is that Donald Duck, you said. Uh, so uh, you can follow us at BCL Business TV. Don't forget our Facebook page. Uh, of course, we do a live stream, uh, Facebook Live each and every week. The programs go out live there as well. You can get us on iTunes. But more importantly, go to the website at businessconnectionslive.com. You get over 200 hours of great business advice for free. Uh, so if you want to make your business bigger, brighter and better, then go along to that website and you'll be able to get the kind of advice that you need. And it could be anything from sales technique all the way through to fundraising. It is all on there. And of course, uh, with uh, things like the uh, employee's pension and, and the, all that is covered on that website. So that's businessconnectionslive.com. You're watching Business Connections Live. Uh, joining me in the studio today is Jerry Brown. He is the customer lifeguard. We're talking about the customer experience. I've worked for a number of organizations and companies in my time, and I will go in there. Some of them still employ me, but, but you go into them, and the, one of the big things, large organizations are always talking about customer service. They, they see it as a cornerstone. Maybe you do too. You see it as a cornerstone to your your company. If you don't give good customer service, it means the customer, you will lose them. And if they go away, you don't have a business. This is fundamental. However, the bigger you are, it seems, and maybe Jerry will agree, the bigger you are, the more lip service you give it, but the less action that you actually give it as well. Do you think that's a fair a fair thing to say, or do you think there are companies out there that are the exception? You mentioned John Lewis earlier on. No, I think there are exceptions. I, I, I don't think that's a, a universal truth that you can say, or oh, if they're big, they don't care. I think 
There are, there are realities that come into play with big organizations. It's the classic turning around the, the, the big ship, whether that's the Queen Mary or whatever it happens to be. I think that's, that's what happens. And, it, but, and if you look at it, there are certain things that are happening. If you look at what's going on in the world today, Royal Bank of Scotland, Ross McEwen announces the potential for 15,000 job losses. Well, yep. when you lose 15,000 people, the chances of being able to focus as much as you'd like to on customer experience or customer service really takes a hit. And I'm not suggesting I, I have no, no uh, uh, beef against the banks generally. I think we all know they've had a tough time, perhaps of their own of their own volition. But at the same time, it is very hard for organizations like that to change. But if you look at uh, people like John Lewis, and the reason I believe they are doing the, as well as they are, is that they started that way. Uh, John Spedden Lewis in the 20s, the son of the founder, he created the partnership model. And they have not deviated from that. If you go online, you read all about how they feel about business. And it's a very different model. So that's a fairly good-sized, large organization. And I think any of us that have been to John Lewis or gone to Waitrose recognize that they they really do do a great job with people, and that's a good size organization. You look at, at some of the, the, the bigger companies uh, in, in the UK that are successful, First Direct as a bank from a financial service perspective, another organization. And a lot of that has come from the people they've hired. They've gone out and hired people that have empathy, that have compassion, that have understanding. And when you bring people into an organization from the beginning that are like that, it really gives you an opportunity. So I don't think it's a universal truth to say all big companies are bad. Uh, or that all small companies are great. I just think it, it depends to a certain extent on your heritage, on your provenance, and a lot of these things as to how well you'll do. But we are a strange country, aren't we, the UK, when it comes to, for many, should we say, department stores or customer-facing area, it seems to be nearly a transient job. Mm. In Canada, in America, if, you're, if you are working in retail sales, that is a career, and therefore you learn the skills of retail sales. In the UK, it's something that you do between leaving university and getting a real job. Mm -hmm. Do you think that causes an issue? I think it does. And I think that one of the things that, and I've, I've certainly spoken about and written about this, the fact that in Canada specifically, I've spent some time in the US, but Canada clearly I have a much better knowledge about. Um, it's not seen as a demeaning job. Customer service is seen as something that is worthy, worthwhile, and Canadians generally are seen as, as decent, occasionally boring, but decent people. Well, the uh, Americans call you loud, don't you? Don't well, they? I don't, I, I don't well, know. Loud anymore. Canadians. Well, they don't, I'm not sure they do anymore. <laughs> I, think, I think we're seeing an interesting thing. You, you, you mentioned the Donald moments ago. I think we're seeing an interesting dynamic and comparison play out between Donald Trump and, uh, and Justin Trudeau. So I think it's really interesting to see two relatively new leaders. But, but really, I think what you're seeing is that people in, in Canada, and to a certain extent in the U.S., don't see it as, a, as something to do between acting gigs. So as a result, they do take it seriously. Now that's not to say they want to work on a shop floor or that they work want to work in a contact center or a call center all their lives, but I think what they do see is that, that customer service can be a career, and I think people and organizations, and I think this is what people like John Lewis have done, they have created an environment in which people actually want to do that. So I think that's another place you see a difference where people actually want to be there. If you think about some of the things that, again, going on in the world right now, I'm, I'm held ransom by Southern Rail. And I, and I just get a sense that most of the people in Southern Rail don't get up in the morning with a spring in their step, go, wow, I can't wait to get to work. I, I, Do you, you know, think so? I, I, <laughs> I, I think it's proven every day. And again, I'm not sure it's their fault. I, I think there's, some, again, some decent people out there. I mean, these, the drivers, they just want to work. They just want to drive. They want to do it. Whatever the issues are, and I really don't want to get into it, but I think they're decent people. But again, they're held back by the organization. And I think this is the thing you have to recognize is that where you can affect people change the way that is beneficial for both customers and the employee. This is why you hear so much about the importance of employee engagement, because if they're not engaged, and I think you know, you, you know you've seen so many figures from people like Gallup are talking about how many people are actually engaged in the company, and it's embarrassingly low. Well, let's talk about some of the sure. key principles that we can actually get, we can put in place within our organization. Sure. And d does this apply to all, all organizations, these, these principles that we're going to come up with? Does it matter how big or small you are? I, I believe it doesn't matter. Uh, I've had this discussion with people as well about, well, Jerry, it's, 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 it's big companies, but we know we're, we're a little SME. We've only got 20 people. Well, no, it probably, it may matter even more to the smaller businesses. But I think the issue here is, is that the principles that, that I talk about, and these are four principles that, that 
what I started to see, and the reason I got into this, is I started to study some of the people that were getting it really well done, and you know, getting it right, and the people that weren't. And I thought, well, what's, what's there? And I'm a pretty simple guy in many ways. And I looked at it and I thought, hmm, there seems to be some things happening here. And it, and it came down to these four principles, culture, communication, commitment, and community. And those are the four principles. Now, could you have five or six? Probably, but I thought four, generally it's the four legs of a stool, it's the four pillars, et cetera. And I started to look at those things in a bit more detail. And I found out that those people that had a culture that was, that was really encompassing, that involved people, and again, I, I look at people like John Lewis, I look at people like Metro Bank. We talked earlier about mission statements and mantras. Uh, the thing they talk about is hire for attitude, train for skill. And they, as an organization, that's what they've done. They've brought the right people in. They've gone out. They've looked for people that really understand how to, how to engage with people. And they can, the rest of it, they can teach them. But this part, they can't. Communication. I look at communication. Great example, again, I mentioned Southern Rail. I'm standing there on uh, Thursday night with, with many other people waiting for the train to, to finally show up on, uh, this was the evening of, of Storm Doris. And uh, one train after another was canceled. No, no announcements, no communication. And this is where many transportation companies, not just train companies, airlines, when we hear these horror stories of people being stuck on the tarmac for three hours, more often than not, they're not told anything. Mm. They sit there, they don't know what's going on, they don't know when something's going to happen, and it's a simple communication. Is that because, you think, people, because the people that are organizing it, who are running the airline or whatever, because that's their day-to-day -day life, it just becomes the norm. And of course, for the, the traveler or the customer, that experience is unique. It's yes. a single event, mm. isn't it? And I, and I think sometimes people forget that, don't they? Yes. If I'm doing something every day, mm. it's interact. It's a bit like cold calling. Right. If you cold call every day, eventually you will get used to the rejection. You will. You will. <laughs> I, I think there's a certain element of that, but I also think um, uh, the phrase I use is that the lack of communication is due to the fear of litigation. And I mean that from the perspective that if I tell you something, oh, well, I think we'll have another train here in 15 minutes and it doesn't show up, you're going to sue me, you're going to do something, same thing with the airlines. And I think there's some of that, so they'd rather so say nothing. So too much information. Exactly. They, they don't, don't want to yeah. say anything. And I, and, I th and I do think that happens sometimes. I think your point is also well made. You do get used to, oh, there's another delay, well, what, you know, what are we going to do? And because I asked various questions, as you probably figure out by now, I'm not going to stand there and just listen while the, uh, we'll watch while the board changes. <laughs> and I, and I try tried to find someone from the train company. I couldn't. I finally tracked down someone from Network Rail. I said, well, you can, would you know what's going on? He had no idea. He, mm -hmm. I mean, he was pleasant. I mean, we had a nice conversation. It was, and he just didn't know what was going on, and he couldn't find anyone else that did. And it was, it, so, so these principles play out in any business, irrespective of the size. I think one of the things that's happening, especially for small businesses, is that they have a chance to really differentiate themselves these days. The, 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 the barrier to entry, if you will, in, especially in, in areas like this, um, there's so much more availability of information. Uh, technology is a lot less expensive for them, so they can compete much better in many cases than with the big guys. So I think you, for me, it's as important. Certainly, if you've only got 20 employees, it's easier perhaps to, to work with them, to get them to affect change. But I don't think it's any less important. Neither do I think it's any different for them. I think they have to be, be focused on these things as well. And, you know, and that's where the other two come in, the community and the commitment. So community means do you have a community? And community in the true sense of the word, but also a community within your organization. One of the other companies I speak about and have had some experience with is Autoglass. Now, Autoglass is a great company because they, they deal with a product that you never really want to buy or get. You know, nobody goes out the weekend and goes, hey, honey, let's go out and look at windscreens. You just don't do it, you know. <laughs> so what happens is, is that they, it's what they call a grudge purchase. When you, boy, when you wake up in the morning, you've got a problem with your windscreen. Uh, whew, what am I going to do now? So you need someone. So they have a tremendous community that, that rallies around because they know when you've got a crack in your windscreen, you need to get that fixed. You need to get it fixed fast and you need to do something. So they've got a tremendous community that rallies around because sometimes they don't have as many people as they need. So they need to bring more people in. And my experience with them has been they all, they all, they really get it. They understand they have to get together. And, and it kind of then leads to the other one, which is commitment. And commitment, you mentioned earlier, do, do people pay lip service to it? Well, the companies that really mean it, 
where the CEO is really on top of it, really do make a just difference. So when, when, when the CEO or the MD is committed to it and they can evidence that they are, not just lip service, they, they, they are making a difference, they want the rest of the organization to do it, and they say they are. So that's, those are the, those are, in a nutshell, those are the four principles that I work from. And by focusing on those, I find organizations really get to understand what's going on. Listen, hold the thought because yep. we're going to come back. We're going to look at some worked examples as well. Sure. Um, I mean, you've, you've kind of covered why a vibrant and inclusive customer experience <laughs> strategy is so vital to business success. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll put a bit of color, a yes. bit of meat on the bones uh, of those four key principles that you can use within your organization. My guest on today's show is uh, Jerry Brown. He is the customer lifeguard. It's great to have him with us on today's program. I hope you're enjoying today's show. If you are sitting there and some of this is absolutely resonating with you at the moment, uh, maybe you work for an organization where this, this the mantra is fed to you and, you, and you've actually got to um, actually do it do what you're told to do when it comes to customer service, then maybe this is giving you a bit of an insight. Uh, if you are somebody that imposes this mantra on your, your workforce, then uh, perhaps maybe you'll find this useful as well. You're watching Business Connections Live. Uh, we are live on the Monday. We're on Facebook Live at the moment. Please do leave a comment about the program, if you don't mind. Just leave it underneath. Uh, also, if you do download or if you listen to this program as a download on iTunes, uh, we'll tell you how to leave a great review in just a few moments' time. But before that, uh, let's look back at something else that is completely related as well to customer service. Jim McLaughlin joined us on the program a while back. Uh, Jim is the Managing Director of Axial. He was on program number 87 in fact on the 22nd of June how to talk the customer's language Jim came into the studio and he discussed the common mistakes made in approaching the customer how to understand how your customer thinks so that you can make it easier for them to buy from you now that seems to be a really good idea if you missed the show let's just give you the key takeaways with Jim McLaughlin if you want to make sure that you get the language right in which you're presenting your your um, your products and services, the first thing that you really need to do is to define who your customers are. We tell our customers to think about it in terms of what size of organization, what market sector they, they work in, is it public or private sector, where are they if, ge if geography is important. Once you know what type of organization that you're selling to or that you want to sell to, the next step is to decide who are the decision makers and who are the influencers who will be involved in making a purchasing decision. You need to prepare your messaging appropriately for those different people in those different organizations. And I would suggest that you have an elevator pitch, just a few words as we talked about earlier that describe what you do. And you've got an elevator pitch that you can deliver in 30 seconds, one that you can deliver in two minutes, and a longer one that you can deliver in five minutes that tells people what benefits you offer, you offer them, usually how you can help them generate more revenue, how you can help them take cost out of their business, how you can tell them, uh, how you can help them remove risk from their business, or how you can help them make their business more agile. Then you need to decide what are the right channels to deliver that message by. Is that going to be through a website, a blog, social media, email, direct marketing, or the telephone? And once you know the answers to all of those questions, it's much easier to make sure that the language that you use is relevant for each of those individuals via each of those channels. That really is the, that's, that, that's what the, the message that I've been trying to get over in a nutshell. Fantastic. Jim McLaughlin there, Managing Director of Axial. And if you want to watch the entire program, you'll find it on the website at businessconnectionslive.com. It's program number 87. Just go to the Watch Again programs. All the shows are there for you to watch. And as I said, there's over 200 hours of great business advice on the website. Simply go to the website at businessconnectionslive.com. Uh, and as I said as well, I would like you very much, please, if you don't mind, pretty please, even, uh, if uh, when you are on the website, if you also leave a nice review on iTunes. If you find the programs uh, interesting, if you find them informative, then simply go along. I will tell you shortly how you should go about doing that right here on this edition of Business Connections Live.
You're watching Business Connections Live. Uh, my guest on today's show is Jerry Brown. He is the cus uh, the customer lifeguard. And we're, we're talking today really about customer experience, why it's so important to every business, how it can retain and keep a customer base or if you don't do it, how you can lose your customer base, how your customers will drift away. There will always be somebody else who will do something somewhere within their business better than you are doing in your business. But why give your customers an excuse to move on? Why give them an excuse to move away from you? Uh, why actually build that kind of sabotage into your own business that's gonna move customers away from you when all you've got to do is apply some straightforward easy principles and then live them. We, we've talked about, Jerry, the the four principles. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've kind of alluded there as well a little bit to it, that it's there will be businesses out there that will write the four principles, they will write their mantras, sure. they will do their customer charter, and then they will lock it away in a drawer and they will never go back to it again. How do you, how do you make those four principles living, breathing, dictates within your organization or at least principles that you live by how do yeah. you do that well um, I, I think the reason that I believe in these so strongly and how you you achieve that is that my model for this was Stephen Covey I've always been a great fan of Stephen Covey and the seven habits of, of successful people and I sort of looked at that and thought you know his his approach was always pretty simple and it was based on fundamental truths one of the, one of the examples he gives in his book which is great he said if, if you're if you're a farmer and uh, you neglect to plant your seeds and do all the work uh, at the beginning of the year, there's no point in trying to throw them in in September and hoping they're gonna grow. It's just not gonna happen. And so he took this very basic approach, and this is really what I did. And so I looked at those four principles and thought, these are things that you have to be looking at and being, uh, as I've said, triggers. They're triggers for activity and actions all the time. So I talk about culture. What, what do I mean by culture? I just went through the paper yesterday, Sunday's paper, the number of references to culture, whether it be the culture that Leicester City had um, following their championship last year and, and the obvious failure they've had this year. Was there a culture of complacency? Was there a culture of giving too much too soon sort of thing? And then I started reading about the new commissioner of the Met and uh, what she had encountered in a, in a very much a male-dominated world. She came, you know, they talked about the macho uh, 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 dominated culture of the Met and stuff like that. And everywhere I went, so culture just keeps coming up. So it's one of those things that organizationally you just have to be aware of. And so c culture can't be mandated, you said earlier. There's no point the CEO saying, you will, you must do this. Culture grows, culture builds, but it's something like flowers, like things, it has to be nurtured all the time. But do you think in large multinational organizations that you, there is a disconnect. We had a we we did a program on employee communications with uh, uh, Mr. Rue who came in, and we he did a, a whole project called cloud busting. Mm. And the the idea was that you've got the employees down here, and then you've got the management up here, and between there's a thick cloud. Right. And what goes on down here they mm. don't see, and what goes on up there they don't see. So you and the project was called cloud busting. The idea was to communicate both ways, and I've seen it in organisations where the senior management think they are doing one thing and they think they are doing it right, right. but in fact, the environment that they are creating or generating is actually disruptive and is not doing what they think. So you'll have uh, lack of engagement, you'll have uh, employees who, who feel that they are being bullied or, or ignored or whatever. So it's this lack of communication going on. Absolutely, and, and that's kind of where the, the, the communication and commitment things o overlap a little bit. Uh, there, was a great, uh, there was a great post on LinkedIn this past week from a CEO who said, I've learned more about my business from sitting with the people in the contact center than I'd ever learned before. And this is something I absolutely recommend to people. Mm. Uh, get down there, get wherever, the, wherever the front line is, if it happens to be a contact center, if it happens to be a store, if it happens to be someone that has a lot of deliveries going on. The people that are, that are doing deliveries for people like DPD, who are, who are a great delivery company, for any of those organizations, the CEO, CEO or MD needs to go out there with them. They but need that, to be but they are different skills though, Jerry, aren't they? For instance, a mm. CEO or a, mm. or a chief executive of a large multinational organization, his skills may well be in talking to bankers and raising money and talking to the city and doing that. And, and he may not even appreciate the skills that his workforce actually need right. on the shop floor. Well, that's, that's why they need to get out there. That's why they need to see what happens. You will learn more 
part of what I do when I work with organization, I do what they call side by side. So that is sitting with a contacts and an agent, with a headpiece, listening to them calls, looking at what's going on on their screen, seeing the challenges that they have. The CEO or MD goes in and does two hours of that a week. I guarantee you, you'll find out more about your business. And the, the reality is, I often wonder, and I, I was reading a story about uh, a CEO who's, who I won't mention, not because he wasn't good, but he was an accountant. And I don't know what the numbers are. Says it all, actually. Oh, I, you know, that, that's, <laughs> says it all. Says it all. So, many, so many of them are come from an accounting background. Now, clearly, you, you must keep the numbers in, in, in view. Of course you do. But I think operationally has become so much more important. So what you said earlier, the point about understanding how a business works, understanding what it means when an employee in a contact center has to say something to uh, a customer that embarrasses them or they find it difficult to say. So getting, getting in amongst them, this is, this is where you start to, dis, you know, this cloud goes away when you start to, and also bringing, doing what I call job sharing, getting people out into different roles. So quite often it's not just the top and the bottom, it's the middle or mm. the bottom layer. Someone in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the shipping department or someone in the parts department has no idea what goes on at the front end. So getting them into the contact center, getting the contact center people out there going, well, look, this is what happens when you send an order through and we, and we don't know if we've got parts or not and the customer gets, you know, all of that kind of but, stuff. But, you know, I suppose the problem is, is that, and we've seen it just recently with RBS as well, so, and you mentioned it earlier on, 1,500, or is it 15,000? 15, 15, yeah, they're talking 15, 10, 15,000. They're, they're yeah. talking a lot of people yes. being made redundant. Yes. And the, the situation that you find yourself there is that could, they've got this resource that they're now going to lose. Would it not be a case of using resources more wisely, more effectively, to actually generate the use them to generate the future? What they what they're doing is the classic accountant's way mm. of making a company more profitable. Yes. They're just getting rid of the overheads, and you see this. There are, I've seen accountants go into organisations, and what they will do, they will get rid of headcount, they will cut back on buildings, they will do all of that because that raises the bottom line. Sure. And then I've seen other accountants go in, and what they've done is they've gone. I tell you what, I'm going to grow the business, and I'm. Going to use those resources and those people to make it more profitable. So it's a very different way. Both achieve the same thing. Mm. I would say the second achieves more because it's a long-term achievement with the people, the resources that you have. Yeah, I think the thing is, is that when the people, whether whether they leave permanently or or every time they walk out the door at night, you lose your 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 most precious resource. They they are the people that can make it or break it. And you know when we're talking about accountants, um, you know if we think about. Uh, this isn't the doubt. We're not we're not beating accountants down. We're, I mean, accountants do a great job. Just by the way. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, th I think it's it's one of those things where uh, you're right. They they get a bad rap sometimes. And if you look at the Oscars from last night, PwC will will find it difficult to recover from that for a while. So they yes. So, but um, you know, it, it's one of those things that y y I, I don't mean to say that. That looking at the money side of it isn't important. Of course it is, and people because that's the that's the business. That's the business. That if you're not making money, you can offer the most fabulous customer service and greatest customer experience. But if you're losing money, guess what? You're not you're not going to continue much longer. So there there is a balance, but it is about understanding. I think really understanding what's going on in the business, and the only way to do that is to get in amongst it. It really is, and I think that's where I you know the, so the, these principles really are founded on the on the basis to to answer your original question. They, they they're continuing. It's not something you do once. You don't build the culture and go, right, we got the culture built, that's fine. That's it. Walk away to you, something else. You have now. to keep doing it. You have to keep learning because you see what's going on in the world. And whether you whether you like what Amazon's doing or, or whatever your feelings about Amazon, if you think about what they've done from a customer service perspective, yeah. think about, I would think, I probably order from Amazon at least once or twice a week yeah. minimum. I'm sure many of us do. And I wonder how many times you've had to call customer service. And the thing is, it is great customer service. It it just no does what it says it does on the exactly box, that. and just just an amazing service. When you go into different organisations, what do you think is the most common mistake that you see? Is there is the 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 classic quick fix, the Jerry Brown, the customer lifeguard, mm. quick fix? You walk in, you go, I've seen all this before. This is the most common mistake. What do you think it is? Well, I think the 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 thing I see is there's a certain amount of complacency. I think there's a certain amount of, especially organisations that compare themselves with other businesses so they might say well actually we're not we're not bad you know we're we're sort of on a par with our competitors 
And of course, the reality these days is that people aren't comparing you necessarily with your competitors. We mentioned Amazon. That's the gold standard for a lot of people, irrespective of the business you're in. You will hear. I mean, people they say, made mistakes too. Oh, though. absolutely, they did. I mean, they they were the, they made the classic mistake of just as you were about the checkout, they mm. would go. Mm. At that point, they would go. Other customers chose to do this, and they were losing sales. Sure. But they they seemed to be quick to learn. Mm. Well, they exactly. seem to understand what their customers want. They seem to be continuously talking to them. Well, I think that's the way they are. They are talking to them, and they're talking to them in very different ways. And I think that, again, is the communication card. How do you, how do you talk to your customers? If you're phys actually talking to them, or are you communicating with them in some way? And I think this, this is where organizations fail. They, they fail the communication test to keep customers involved, keep them informed about things. One of the uh, frightening statistics, I was at a conference this, this this week that came out was the number of people, you talk about checkout, the number of people that abandon at checkout mm. and or the number of companies that don't follow up on that. This is gold. This is if, if people have, have taken the time to go online, have taken the time to actually buy a product if you like, but have failed at checkout for whatever reason, and it could be their, their fault as well. But organizations that fail to follow up on that. And but there's all kinds of ways you can do that now. It's not, it's not that hard to be able to send a note to someone or, or this is where sometimes you see that dreaded web chat come in, can we help you? Well, actually, you might want to help someone that's failing at checkout. I mean, very, very briefly, the thing that's interesting about Amazon is with the reports that are coming out and the news stories that are coming out of it, is that while they're, they're providing fantastic customer service and they're delivering the products when they say they're going to deliver them, as to work there can actually be quite difficult yeah. and can be unfulfilling and can be, you know, some people say a bit of a cattle market. Yes. At least that's what the reports say. Yeah. So that's showing that the culture to the customer is one thing, yes. but the culture within the organization is something else. And that, that is important, Steve, because I think eventually that will come back to bite you. I think, you know, the classic, the even worst case, of course, with that is uh, with Sports Direct, with, with, you know, all the things that have been going on there. And, and you know, that's even apparently a worse environment. So I, I I, I do agree with you that you you can't uh, you can't speak with one mouth to the customer about culture and then treat people badly. It will come back. I don't know what they'll what Amazon will do and how much of it's true. I don't doubt there's a lot of truth in it because in order to deliver that they've got to do. I mean, they, they've got to do it. So I think that's a challenge for businesses. I think it is a challenge to be able to to, to totally walk the walk and talk the talk because otherwise they're uh, sooner or later. You know, we will be in a in a robot world. I mean, we're heading in that direction clearly, um, and there won't be anyone else that will want to work there. So yes, I think that that is an issue for businesses, and this is where the cost thing comes in. More from Jerry Brown in just a few moments' time, right here on this edition of Business Connections Live. Well, live as always on a Monday. Great to have your company with us. I was alluding earlier on to the fact that we would like you to leave positive reviews, please, if you mind, on uh, iTunes. Uh, thousands of downloads each and every month now on iTunes. In fact, every time I look at uh, uh, our service provider that delivers the programs to iTunes and to Stitcher and the Blueberry, I am amazed at how many of you now are downloading and taking Business Connections Live with you when you're maybe uh, going on your trip or you're sitting on the underground or you're in in the buses or you're just heading into work so thank you for that very much indeed now if you find the program useful please do leave a positive review of the program that way we can share the good words that are coming from our guests like jerry today to a larger and wider audience and really that's why we're doing this um, i mean we're, we're driven by other things as well we we want to provide you with a great service but if you think the program is great then why don't you tell everybody that way it'll be recommended to other business owners entrepreneurs smes uh, business leaders as well. It's dead easy. All you got to do, go along to the website and um, just find this. Uh, you'll find Business Connections Live. Uh, view in iTunes, first of all. Click on that link. You'll find this link on the website. That'll then take you to ratings and reviews. Click on that. And then that'll take you down to this bit here where it says leave or write a customer review. Say something nice about the program, how you found it useful, and then give it a five-star rating. We'd really, really appreciate that, and it'll make the program even more successful. But once again, if you are one of the tens of thousands of people who are downloading on iTunes each and every month, we do seriously applaud you and say thank you very much indeed for making Business Connections Live so successful. And also, if you are one of the people who are watching on a YouTube YouTube, or maybe on Roku as well. If you're watching on Roku, uh, then thank you very much for watching the program. But please do leave a comment. Let us know what you think. If you're a business owner and you'd like a program just like this one, 
to engage your employees or maybe engage your customers. I mean, you have a look at your website. Is your website full of text? I mean, or is it full of lists, lists and text? Well, why don't you turn your readers into viewers? It's dead easy. If you'd like more details on that, or you'd like to maybe just have a chat about how you could improve that form of communication within your business, then drop us an email to studio at businessconnectionslive.com. Or why don't you give us a call? Just ring us. Have a word myself or Linda Bazant. She's a nice lady. 01784 256 777. She told me to tell you that, by the way. There. Thank you very much for the fiver. Steady now, I'll get in the trouble. 01784 256 777. Have a word with uh, myself or with uh, Linda. Don't forget, you can follow our stream of consciousness, find out what's coming up on the next week's program by going to either YouTube or by following us on Twitter at BCL Business TV. Watch the live programs and leave comments as well on Facebook, as well on our Facebook page. But more importantly, visit the website at businessconnectionslive.com where you'll find over 200 hours of business advice and we've got some very exciting news uh, from that website coming up we're going to be offering an additional service very shortly that will give you the competitive edge it'll give you your a marketing advantage it will stand you just ever so slightly above your competitors and will allow you to be more successful in your business regardless of the size of your organization something coming along in uh, the next four to five weeks in fact from the website so do watch out for that you're watching Business Connections Live. My guest on today's show is Jerry Brown. He is uh, the customer lifeguard. He's on a mission to rid the world of bad customer service and knows that delivering a great customer experience isn't just a nice to have, but a serious contributor to the bottom line. Uh, if you want to find out more about Jerry, you can go to his website. It is uh, the customer lifeguard, saving the world from bad customer service. The website is an interesting read. In fact, uh, you can get all sorts. I was just looking at his blog just looking at his blog before we um, we kicked off the program and a lasting legacy of eternal damnation redemption is in the clouds and some of the topics that you actually do on your blog I love the, the titles are fantastic Thank find you. out more go to his website is customerlifeguard.com you'll find out more about our guest today Jerry Bound the customer lifeguard okay we're, we're, we're heading rapidly towards the end of the program and we're what other things can businesses do to improve their customer experience, do you think? We've mentioned that it's not all about giving lip service, it's mm -hmm. about engaging your staff, it's about communicating with your customers. We've talked about the people that are getting it right, but yet every company has its failings. Sure. What else can we do to improve? Well, I think one of the things you mentioned, that particular blog that I posted, and it was really uh, coming to the, the heart of what some of the companies are finding big challenges, is that even if you're doing it well, you've got good intentions, your people are good, quite often I find the technology doesn't support what they want to do. And I'm a big one for not starting with technology. I don't think it's the natural starting point. Even though it's your background, isn't Even it? Even though it's my background. But I, what I do say is that once you've got an understanding of what the challenges are, technology then can really help you. So that particular blog that you, you mentioned was all about looking at the fact that most businesses have these really big legacy systems, whether it be order entry, whether it be ticket issuance, whatever it is, airlines, they've all got these big systems and they can't really do with, do away with them but they cause employees a great deal of problems because they're not that flexible so most people when they call in if they're calling to a contact center they want to be they want someone to know that they've spoken to them last week they've sent them an email they've tw whatever it is they want that person to have view of what they've done most businesses don't do that you phone up some of the large utility companies they'll ask you what your account number yes. is and the yeah. first thing they'll ask you when you talk to a, a, an agent is What's your account number? Exactly. And most people don't know it. Most people know their name. They can yeah. figure that one out. They can remember out. that one They can get that one. Probably a phone number. But that's right. You're right. A lot of companies, oh, what's the account number? What's something that is very obtuse? So having the information in hand, firstly, it gives the employee a great deal more confidence because they are frustrated. I've sat and watched these people as a customer says, well, I sent you an email last week. Don't you have it? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I don't have access to emails. Well, I, I, I was chatting with one of your, oh, I don't have access to web chat because they are siloed systems. And so what happens is, is they, they can't act on what the customer wants as quickly as the customer would want. So it increases frustration for both of them. So what I talk about in that particular thing, what I talk with customers about is the cloud, you mentioned the cloud earlier, here's where the cloud can pay off for you. 
What's happening is that technology that's moving to the cloud is much more flexible, much more agile. It means that organizations can put some of these things in place much quicker and much easier. They can talk to these legacy systems. So if you like, it's like a translation tool. It can pull out all of the rich information that can provide the advisor with immediacy in terms of, oh, yes, I see, you placed an order last week. Oh, yes, I see, you called us because you didn't, whatever it happens to be. It gives everyone so much more information, but it also saves a lot of time because... But, I've but we still have this hierarchical mm. approach within business where you will you will have the you know you'll have the senior board and then below that you'll have the individual the divisions which are going to be sitting there so you'll have you know customer service then you'll have customer complaints and and what they tend to do is that they will split these down yes. into different streams so is it is it the technology or is it just the structure for many of these large businesses and yes. for small businesses not to fall into the same trap mm. i think it can be but what what some organizations uh, are doing uh, they're now having a chief customer officer or of head of customer experience. And what's important is that they have some autonomy and some authority because quite often it's in name only. If you give these people the opportunity and give them the authority, they, they still may need to go to the CEO to get the check signed. But let's assume that they, they have visibility on what the issues are. They're, they they pr uh, provide a bridge, say, between the IT team and the customer service team so that they can talk a language that both understand and get things moving. Because that's what happens. You're absolutely right. It gets bogged down in all of the bureaucracy that, that's going on in a business. So, uh, so approach, approach their customer mm. service systems mm. in, uh, because systems just evolve anyway, right. don't they? So put something, I mean, that's a lot of money for a lot of, for the sure large organizations, yes, it is. isn't it? But again, some of these cloud systems that I'm talking about, they're subscription services, they don't cost as much money. We've heard, heard so much over the years, especially in the well, government I can't imagine sector. a utility company has been, you know, 20 quid. How many customer clients have you got? Oh, yeah. I've got 1.6 billion, yeah. Yeah. you know. <laughs> no, but I mean, when I say a subscription service, I'm talking on the basis of subscriptions for the advisors that they've yeah. got. We've heard so many failed IT projects lately in, in, the, yes. in the customer, in the public sector. You know, billions, millions, billions spent. And when you look at what it can cost, these, these cloud solutions are much less expensive than they ever were before. You can do a trial, you can get into them fairly easily. Now, yes, if you've got 2,000 agents, it might start costing you some money, but you can get into them quickly, you can test them. Most of these organizations are more than willing to, to do a proof of concept with you, and you can understand exactly how they can help you. Because this is what the CEO is going to say. They're going to say, all right, well, you put that in, how's it going to help me? If you can demonstrate quickly and effectively, A, it makes a difference, it saves us time, the customers are happy, our, our customer scores go up, you can do that reasonably quickly and cost effectively, then you can start making some progress. All right, that's systems. What else would you suggest that they look at? Well, I think the- This is need the takeaways. You're gonna repeat it all again yes, in a moment. Yes, I, I, yeah. I, I think, again, what I mentioned before is about the employee engagement, because we talked about that. Now, when I talk about employee engagement in this aspect, what I'm talking about is the involvement that they will have in designing a systems. More often than not, when we talk about systems, they get these systems put on them. Oh, we've got this new system. Oh, we, we, you know, we didn't know anything about it. I wish they'd asked us about it. That's where I start with a lot of businesses. I really I ask the frontline people because they know where all the bodies are buried. They know what's going on. They know what the issues are. They know why they're having trouble finding information. And they will help you design a system. They'll do a fabulous job. So you really need to involve them from day one. Get them showing you what isn't working, showing you what could work. You can do this quite quickly. Trust me, I've done it. And so what I see is that people are, are not willing to do that, but if they're willing to engage the people in the, in the design process, not just the technical design, but the processes. What are we doing that is that, that customers are frustrated with? So the whole stop, start, continue thing. You know, are we doing things that neither is helping us or the, com the customer? Are we doing things that just helps us but not the customer? Well, stop them. You know, if they're not helping you, then don't do them anymore because customers or are you just going to say, why are you asking me that question? Well, I don't know. I, you know, switch it's this. on my list. It says in my script. So I, I think these are the sorts of things involving those people in it. And, and you know, br br being able to, to, to use measures. Again, we, we talk about how you measure this. So many organizations are still using operational measures. So how long was the customer on the phone? How long did it wait before they answer the call? 
I'm not saying they're not important, but as a measure of how well we're delivering customer service and customer experience, they're not telling you anything. So you have to look at those measures. So you answered in, a lot of calls in two minutes, yes, but you didn't resolve exactly, any issues. Exactly. I, I see so many times our customers saying, we, we aim to answer every call in within 10 seconds. Well, that's good, but I'd rather I wait a little longer and find someone that actually can help me than have someone that says, hello, oh no, I can't help you, <laughs> what's the point? So I, I think these are all the things, and again, they all come out when you start looking at these four principles. One of those four principles will, will have all of these things just ready to pour out. Jerry, time has beaten us. It's been a, a fascinating insight. I just get the feeling that there's enough material for two or three programs when it comes to customer experience and customer service. What we do at the end of every program, we sure. always ask our guests to look straight down camera number one mm -hmm. and to give us the key takeaways sure. that we as business owners, entrepreneurs, that we should all be thinking about mm -hmm. when it comes to that customer experience and how maybe that experience can change the way our businesses operate and become more successful. So please say sure. who you are and yep. where you're from. Yep. Straight down camera number one, the airwaves, Jerry, are all yours. Thank you, Steve. Well, uh, Jerry Brown, the customer lifeguard, and the reason that I look at it from that perspective, I do think that some if, if I'm not saving businesses from themselves, I'm certainly saving them to be able to do the right thing for customers. So I've always taken a great deal of interest. So I think the thing you have to look at is it's important to, as I said earlier, you must engage everyone in this from the top to the bottom. If you don't do that from a starting perspective, if you don't begin to engage the people, people will call it cross-functional teams, they will call them uh, multi mold or whatever you want to call it, but get everyone in the business involved. That doesn't mean hundreds of people, it just means representatives from different parts of the business that can clearly tell you what's going on. Getting those people engaged and involved is critical. Secondly, look at what the customers are telling you. Some organizations do customer surveys on a very regular basis, and I'm sure we're all frustrated when somebody says to us, oh, would you mind filling out a survey at the end of the call? Well, yes. Uh, I don't mind doing it, but one of the things I wanted to make sure is if I'm going to give you information, if I'm going to help you, I want you to act on it. So make sure if you get feedback from customers, you actually do something with it and you let them know that you've done something with it because otherwise it's just a waste of time for both parties. Uh, thirdly, make sure that you've got the enabling uh, uh, technology in place. Again, is, this won't be a quick or easy fix, but certainly understanding where it's going wrong will help you. And as I said earlier, if you look at some of the cloud solutions that are available in the marketplace today, there's some amazing things out there that can really help you in both making it easier for your employees and your customers, but also making it easy for you to measure how well you're doing. So those are the kinds of things that we're, we're looking at. And fourthly, I would say, if you can really get to the heart of the communication with your customers. If you're not able to get the message out to your customers in terms of how effectively how best to do business with you, give them the clues because a lot of organizations fail miserably to communicate to them about how they can benefit from doing business with a company without really telling them how to do that. Oh yeah, they, they put a phone number up there and you've got a website, but there's no point in having a website in which you have a problem and then you need to contact the business. You can't do that easily and quickly. So really what it's about is making it easy for your customers. And whether you delight them by making it easy, because there's a big debate going on, do, should we delight them, should we make it easy? Either way, make it easy for your customers, make them want to come back, make them want to spend more money with you, and if you do that successfully, you will be successful as a business. Jerry, thank you very much indeed. An absolutely fascinating insight into the customer experience. And I hope you found it useful today. Uh, I have found it absolutely fascinating. So to my guest today, Jerry, thank you, Jerry Brown, the Thanks, customer lifeguard. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And as I said, I hope you've enjoyed it as well today. It's been a real insight view. If you leave, just, you know, leave your comments, tell us what you thought about the program. Uh, we'd really enjoy that. Now, let's have a look at what's coming out. A little bit of housekeeping uh, to do before we uh, finish off the program. Well, coming up on the future programs, Antonio Falco. He's going to be talking about sales on next week's edition or on a future edition of uh, program. Nigel Risner, motivational speaker. He's going to be joining us here. Deborah Hume, Ali Crump from A Drive Tech, uh, Jackie Jarvis. Uh, we've got Warren Knight, uh, along with a whole host of other experts in business. All you've got to do is uh, keep uh, watching us each and every week here at Business Connectors Live. Listen, I hope you enjoyed today's program. From all the team here, thank you very much indeed. Don't forget, tune in live next month at midday but from myself Steve Hyland and my guest Jerry Brown have a great week have a successful one we'll see you then bye for now bye bye